morning, good morning, hello, how are you? Lovely day for photography. Nice low grey cloud. I haven't done a video recently because I've been going into work on my um, scooter. I've got a little uh, Piaggio 200cc scooter. I say little, it does 70 mile an hour, so it's, uh, it's not exactly underpowered, but uh, used to use it for commuting into work and it's quite good fun because uh, you know you get all these cars whizzing past you on the dual carriageway and then when you get to the first set of traffic lights you're like hello hello it's nice to see you again goodbye see you later and that's what's good about it it's, it's so brilliant in heavy traffic but um and it's not too bad in um, ordinary traffic either so, how are things, how are things, we are so busy, we are so busy. When I think, I bought this practice on some weeks, I swear we didn't have a single patient. And that was because we had a, um, an associate who worked for us, who decided that uh, uh, we, there, there was a principal who was an implantologist and an associate who did all the general dentistry when I bought the place and announced my intention to do most of the general dentistry, the associate decided that there wouldn't be enough left for her. So she decided to move elsewhere. And so she basically, um, uh, in conjunction, and by in conjunction, I don't mean in, in, in sort of by working together, although I'm not ruling that out, but at the same time as the um, receptionist was um, talking to people and saying oh yes you know I know you used to see so and so she's working here now not she's not working here now she's working somewhere else blah 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 so so the practice was really severely undermined um, in terms of its patient base and it was like uh, <laughs> stupid because the receptionist ended up getting made redundant because um, first of all the uh, well, basically because her job became redundant. You know, we just didn't need a receptionist. Uh, you know. Oh, hello. Someone's had a bang. I don't want to... Uh... Oh, looks like someone's gone in the back of a... Oh, never mind. Never mind if I've been there. That's the second accident I've seen at that junction. So, anyway... Uh... Yeah, so I hope, I'm sure you're busy too. I mean, the NHS has just taken this step of uh, from the 1st of July of requiring that uh, everybody do 100% of their pre-COVID contract workload in uh, return for 100% of their pre-COVID contract income. <coughs> Which you might say, yeah, well, fair enough, you know, but the trouble is these... Uh, people that are very uh, right on are uh, doing a lot of stuff still to counteract Covid which is slowing them down and and, and, and I think they quite like the idea of them <coughs> excuse me they quite like the idea of getting um, 100% of the money for 80% of the work uh, or 100% of the money for 60% of the work or 40% of the work or whatever it was they used to get so, so, yeah, so they're all crying like babies, but I don't think for a minute, I don't think it's going to mean that the amount of NHS work is going to increase significantly. I mean, we've had a, we've had a situation where everyone was given out antibiotics and now they've been asked to do some, produce some UDAs. And, um, in the meantime, they've got so used to doing stuff privately, or you know, being able to say to people, "I'm sorry, I can't do that for you on the NHS because you know the waiting list is in September, which is normal." I mean, my waiting list now is almost in September because I'm having two weeks off in August. I've got uh, I'm starting at 8:15. I'm starting at 8:45 this morning, and I've already got more patients ringing up than I've got space for this morning. So, I might have to ask the girls to stay um, later or we might have to just ask the patients to come down and wait in their cars or, you know, so that we can see them and 
to, there is an expectation amongst my patients that if they ring up a toothache that I will see them that day or the next day and we might, uh, but when I say toothache I mean like a twinge, you know, so we are having to arbitrage that a bit. We had a staff meeting yesterday about what direction we want to take the surgery in because obviously it's, it's now profitable and um, you know, it's a mixture of um, new patients with toothache who need a lot of work and other people who have got a bit of money, like for example, this guy who's never brushed his teeth but wants bridges on three, two, one, one, two, three. Um, so we've come up with this plan whereby we do pain relief immediately, but then explain to people that, you know, if they want bridges that there is there is a bit of a waiting list to be booked in for advanced work. And then, um, but then when we book them in for the advanced work, we book in all the appointments at the same time. So, for example, with a bridge, you don't just book in the prep, you book in the fit. And for a dentist, you don't just book in the impressions, you book in the bite, the try and the fit. But that's gonna have the effect of making our waiting list even worse than ever. You know, it's gonna be further, further than ever. But I think in terms of the actual patient journey, as it's now called, um, the, um, it's probably going to give them the best possible uh, experience given the, um, the excess of uh, demand over supply that there is at the moment. So, what else is going on? I mean, there's a lot of other significant stuff going on and then most of it's going on over the head of uh, everybody who's driving along this road. Um, the uh, Germany, that you, which you, one third of Germany's energy goes on its chemical and pharmaceutical sectors is, and used to be very pally with Russia, has had their main supply pipeline shut off for maintenance and there was a lot of worry about whether the Russians would turn it back on again and now they've only they've turned it on but just at 40%, which is precisely what I would expect when you're you're pressurising something back up, like a gas main, you know. You're not going to just say, oh yeah, flick everything you want. Oh yeah, <laughs> just like, no, put a 40% pressure in it and then test for leaks, that's what I would do. Anyway, that's what they've done. But um, there's still a lot of uh, worry about uh, uh, energy uh, scarcity this winter. And, I, and again, I don't think anybody driving down this road is, understands that, uh, you know, Bearing in mind that they've decapped the um, dom domestic uh, consumer prices uh, for gas, uh, or they haven't decapped them, but they've, they've raised the cap uh, quite a lot. And it's due to be raised quite a lot again in October, I think, or November. Um, and so people are now going to be spending, I don't know, £3,000 a year, possibly two and a half thousand, three thousand 3000 a year, on just eating their homes, doing their cooking and stuff, running the central heating. Um, and you know, out of the average wage, which I think is probably about 25 grand, I mean, that's post tax, that's that's a lot of uh, there might even be pre tax, I don't know. But there's um, the uh, we're in the I always say we're in the Finder regime, you know, it's the fall of Rome, it's the fall of the Greek Empire, or the, the uh, Assyrians, whatever you name it, you name it, you name an empire that fell. And we're in the uh, we're in the same situation, and in those sort of situations, all sorts of mad and mysterious things happen, and uh, you have to sort of understand and model the, what's happening, and then take uh, appropriate action. So, for example, uh, Boris Johnson's resigned. Uh, it's a bit difficult to know why. I think I think it's because he's an intellectual and people hate intellectual anyway he he uh, was mercilessly uh, attacked in the media both uh, uh, print and TV um, you know over over stupid things you know over like uh, the fact that he'd been briefed that one of his MPs was a bit of a loose cannon several years ago and then he didn't immediately remember that you know as if anyone else would remember if you said to someone can you remember what you were doing on a certain day three years ago? They're going to say, oh yeah, I remember that. I mean, of course you don't, you know. And then someone reminds you and said, actually, if you remember, we uh, met at such and such. And uh, that well, that was what was one of the things that was on the agenda. And you're like, yeah, well, fair enough. 
but apparently no, that's a resigning issue. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a picture of Boris raising a glass of wine with some, uh, uh, some, some of his political staff. And uh, there's a similar picture of uh, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, raising a bottle of beer with some of his staff. And uh, Boris got a fine for breaking COVID lockdown rules and Starmer didn't. And so, you know, bearing in mind, you know, I've always said that politics is just smoozing, it's just socialising, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like you couldn't do PR without the, the parties, you know, the free buffets and the, the, the wine and all that. And, uh, and so, of all the professions, politics is probably one of those that where you know just getting together around the table and having a glass of wine and doing a bit of uh, idea generation is you know I, I wouldn't be at all unhappy with that. But that brings me to ultimately what I think got rid of him was the hypocrisy. I think that there's this whiff of hypocrisy in that he was. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> he's responsible for some of the, the most sort of um, zealously enforced uh, lockdown rules since the Blitz and, um, and yet was seen to be routinely uh, more or less applying the rule that uh, these things apply to other people and not to him not, not seem to be taking them as seriously as he was asking everybody else to. Hello, here comes an ambulance. So. There he goes. Yeah, so, so it was the hypocrisy that did him. Do you mean there? There's one thing the British public can't stand is hypocrisy, and really they, you know, I mean there was the this thing I always remember. But there was a funeral, and everyone was spaced six feet apart, and the poor old mum was crying because her husband had died, and the son went over to put his arm round her, and some, if in jobs worth, from the crematorium came out and um, insisted that he return to his seat because he wasn't allowed to get close to his mother, you know, like. Uh, afterwards when they went back to her house they weren't going to get close then anyway you know and it was all caught on camera because this crematorium's got a camera in it and that really shocked people you know I mean you give you, you bring these rules in and facial recognition technology is one of the ones at the moment that everybody's debating and they're saying oh you know that there's these massive queues at airports and uh, um but the whole, but if we could just get you to walk down a corridor that's stuffed with cameras, we could do facial recognition on everybody, and then you could just walk down this corridor and walk straight in. Cut the queues. Well, everyone's like, oh, this is a brilliant idea. You know, this is a brilliant idea. Oh, well, let's have some of that. Let's get facial recognition. Let, how, how do I get my face recognised? How do I register my face for this, you know? And, and yet, they, what they don't realise is that this is always the camel's nose under the tent, you know. Once you start getting facial recognition technology for this, then it starts being used for other less savoury things as well. And, uh, you know, like for example, if you report a positive COVID test, then uh, your face will be, your face will be <laughs> on every... Uh, on every shopping centre database so that as they scan the faces of people walking around they'll be looking to see if you have had if you've gone into a shop that wasn't for food or medical supplies and uh, you know they've got a form on this the uh, government at one point we all used to have passports and the passports were checked at the border and whether or not your passport was valid was um, sufficient, you know, as to whether or not you could cross the border or not. 
I mean, they could keep a track of who'd crossed the border, but in fact, there were so many people crossing the borders and there wasn't much computerization at the time that it was very difficult to try and keep a um, track of who was in and who was out of the country, you know? I mean, this was in the days when computers were very rudimentary and nobody ever believed that there would be a computer big enough to have um, have everybody on it, you know? Like there, we couldn't have a database of 60, 70 million people yeah, where do you think you're going? Okay. And then um, what they did was they then uh, brought in this uh, strip down the bottom, which was a machine readable characters. And um, so then what they could do is instead of having to look at your passport, they would they would zap it, you know, through this slot. And um, when they was brought in, everybody said, "Oh well." You know, it's only it's only the information they look at anyway. You know, it's not not really any different. It's exactly the same. Whereas in fact, it wasn't the same because for the first time, it gave them the opportunity to record instantaneously all your details, which then went on a database, and so they then had a database of of uh, movements. You know, your movements, which they didn't have before, which means it wasn't exactly the same as before. And uh, so, you know, there was some. Uh, implications in terms of security and privacy for you. Now, of course, it's all done on a chip, so that uh, they don't have to slide the passport through the um, thing anymore. They just you you do it yourself. You know, you touch the passport on and get your face recognised, and then you get through. So there's um anyway there's plenty more going on. I mean I've done the the Boris re the hypocrisy resignation, but um, let's uh, let's carry on with that because there are two candidates, Rishi uh, Sunak and uh, Liz Truss, who've emerged as the two contenders for a pro job of prime minister, and um, both of those have got quite interesting economic histories so it might be worth just touching on those a bit that might help you prepare a bit for the coming tsunami okay uh, I'm at work now nice to talk to you talk to you soon bye good morning hello good morning what a lovely day no CCTV today took the chip out to get the footage of it from the last time I recorded something and then uh, didn't put it back in again pain. Anyway, it's a Monday morning, I'm off to work, we've got a busy day ahead, I think we've only got uh, two more weeks before, uh, two weeks off holiday, <clears throat> we've got payday coming up, it's the 25th of July, so we've got uh, next Sunday, this Sunday will be payday. not a big deal these days, it used to be. So we're still in the throes of the uh, Tory leadership between Sunak and uh, Truss. They're both, uh, <clears throat> in this country we have a convention that the Prime Minister is the leader of the party with the largest majority. And so what we do is we elect the party and the party members elect the leader. Uh, I'm not so sure that's... Uh, in the, the old GDPA we used to do it the other way around. What happened was we used to... Uh, the members used to nominate... Uh, used, to, used to elect the council, so they used to put forward like 12 names. Uh, elect 12, 12 people onto the council and then the council members themselves used to choose the um, <clears throat> used to choose the chairman and in my opinion that was a better idea because uh, the uh, party members don't really know the candidates as well as the council members do because the council members are by definition in interested in the politics of it all and they know people personally for the most part and also um, there's no point uh, you know there's no point 
putting together an England football team and then asking the public to vote on who they want to be the captain. The captain has to be someone who's got leadership skills, uh, you know, good at persuasion, good at conciliation, arbitration, and uh, and is respected by the the team that he's going to lead. And the best way to do that is to get them to elect a leader, you know. But anyway, it's not being done. It's being done the other way round. They've... Uh, The volunteers have assembled into a team, and now they're asking the uh, the uh, top end to say who should be captain. So we've got—I mean, they are a motley bunch. Um, you know my opinion on politics. Really, these days is that it's it's not a meritocracy. It's, it's very much a sort of a people fighting like cats in a bag for just a, a naked power grab and um, a lot of it's about money you know many many of the cabinets are millionaires if not billionaires um, you know and yeah we've got the effrontery to criticize countries like China and Russia for being led by uh, the, the uh, landed class So, you've got, on the one hand, you've got Sunak, who used to be the um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and, and to a large extent is responsible for the uh, failing, the continuing failure of fiscal policy, government monetary policy. Um, you know, by running the printing presses and uh, increasing the money supply, debasing the currency, all the stuff you've heard me talk about. And the conservative base wants tax cuts. And he's in a difficult position because he can't say yeah I'm I'm I mean he says that I'm a tax cutter at heart but he's actually increased the tax base a hell of a lot and there there were big uh, tax rises uh, planned that he put in place like corporation tax going up from 19 to 25 percent um, he's put up national insurance for most people uh, so anyway um so he's not really, you know, he's not the person to uh, turn us into the new Singapore on Thames. And um, was heavily implicated in, uh, as Chancellor in the Boris cabinet in terms of um, not so much, uh, I mean, collective responsibility for the decisions they made, certainly, but really just the disloyalty of, um, you know, uh, knowing in the back of his mind that should anything happen to Boris he would be certainly putting his hat in the ring for Prime Minister and it's very difficult to I know everybody you know wants to be the captain of the team etc but the trouble was that the team that Boris led was was you know took the pitch and uh, for a very big fixture against Russia and um, when he turned round his goalie and his striker had walked off and said no I'm, I'm, we're giving up so that doesn't really bode well for Rishi and in fact he's going to suffer from that because he's although he might be popular in Westminster and have a lot of money to fund uh, his campaign uh, you know the grease, the grease the wheels and all that grease the palms oil the wheels but uh, he's not popular amongst the conservative voting base now that may be because he's uh, from an ethnic minority in this country I don't think it's an ethnic minority in the world but an ethnic minority in this country or it may be um, funnily enough I think it may be because he's just tiny I mean he's a short bloke and politicians successful politicians tend to be tall people people who are a little bit supersized 
and you've only got to look at, uh, well, I mean, you know, the royal family are strangely tall. The people like Trump and that were above average height. David Cameron was described as strangely high recently, strangely tall. Um, you know, people like Biden, Pence, they're all over six foot, these people. Um, when where uh, short people have written, uh, short people have stood for office, then they come in for a lot of um, ridicule, which is, is unfair, it's not their fault. I mean, they could be very, very capable of doing the job, but you know, you just don't want to be led by someone, by a short person. If you're going into battle, you don't want to be led by someone who's five foot six. Yeah. Unless he's got superpowers. Um, there was a politician called Michael Dukakis, and he ran for president, and he was um, a Greek uh, parentage. And... Uh, he was put out of the race by a simple slogan, beware of Greeks wearing lifts, which is obviously a hybrid version of beware of Greeks bearing gifts. But it referred to the fact that, you know, to get himself up to some sort of decent height, he might, he'd have to wear platform shoes. And that was it really, that was the end of him. So, so you've got this tiny, uh, guy standing on <coughs> frantically trying to dissemble about his political views and being being associated with all the failures like failures on immigration that have dogged the government and then uh, on the other hand you've got Liz Truss who is was to a large part of the conservative base I think seen as a bit of a superwoman because she was brought in to um, put together a bunch of trade deals when we came out of Europe. So she, um, and she sort of um, seemed to get stuck into that and people of my generation who can remember New Zealand lamb and uh, Danish bacon and all the stuff that we used to get cheap before we joined the European Union, and, and it all began, you know, it had, and they said that they they put in a support price to um, protect the farmers, and the price of everything to the consumer went up, and a load of stuff got made, which was then wasted, and then we started getting stories about the Butter Mountain and the Wine Lake and all this. Um, so she she trotted off to Australia and said, you know, how do you fancy resurrecting that old that old deal we had for buying your lamb or whatever. And uh, and she sort of opened a little window on how things used to be before we joined the European Union. Even though she was, I believe, a Remainer, and there was a bit of, uh, you know, a lot of people had reservations about putting a Remainer in charge of negotiating our trade policy. But, you know, give her a due, she did to the extent that she was allowed to and that she could uh, put together a few trade deals. I don't know how much they amounted to really. I don't know whether they uh, you know, were more about the sound and the fury rather than the substance. But um, anyway, uh, and then she's come straight off the bat by saying that she's going to cut all these tax rises that are coming in. She's going to cancel all those. Uh, and all the money that we pay, one third of the money that we pay on our fuel bills, which is designed to subsidise uh, inefficient green energy, um, is going to get cancelled for a year. Um, and then uh, she's going to uh, go hard on uh, immigration, which always sells well uh, at the base. And, um, and in response, uh, Sunak has uh, come back and said he's going to put a limit on refugees coming into the country 
which was a stupid thing to say because by definition you can't stop a refugee coming in if they're a refugee they're entitled to refugee refugeeism and refugee status you could say that you're going to put a limit on just absolute numbers of immigration you know but not you can't limit refugees but it's as I say it sells well because where we are in this country although we are a mecca for um, economic tourism economic refugeeism which we shouldn't be because you know and I've I've uh, been flying around and someone in my plane passenger has said you know and I said to them like this is where all the people come across in the rubber boats and this person said uh, you know just how terrible must it be for them to want to undertake that journey that 20 20 mile journey usually on a nice sunny day in a boat and that they deserve all our sympathies whereas in fact the people are not stupid and they do know that when you're seeking asylum you're supposed to seek asylum in the first safe country you come to not the 10th uh, and so what they've done is they've hopscotched across Europe with the tacit agreement of the countries they pass through who are not happy to see them arrive but happy to know that there is a, an exit door and that they are going to want to go through that door as soon as possible and the country will want to encourage them to go through that door as soon as possible and they'll see the back of them whereas we are the because we're the end of the line we see them coming in and we don't see them going out and we shouldn't see them coming in we shouldn't see them coming in they're not you know the other side of that channel is France it's not Syria okay it's not Palestine it's not uh, Beirut anyway so that's I think probably trust will get it because uh, to be honest with you I think Sunak must have known that as soon as it goes to the, the base that um, he's going to lose against en anybody but the absolute worst candidate so he must have been expecting to lose. I think he thinks he can, I don't know, spend his way to victory or... He's certainly more experienced politically. Perhaps he's hoping that, uh, and and you know, all the papers have lined up. Say Sunday Times, for example, going out. Oh, Sinek is such a great guy, and and uh, higher taxes are not a problem because uh, you know the, the people who want to lower taxes say that it leaves more money in the companies. Therefore, they'll do more investment, and the, therefore we'll get more economic growth. Whereas the people who uh, argue against that, say that to promise to cut taxes or to lower taxes, there's no evidence that that produces any economic growth because there has been none during the period when the taxes were lower. All that happens is that the uh, companies use their new found wealth to buy back their shares, which then increases the value of the shares and uh, results in the executives getting big fat pay payouts, you know, big fat bonuses. But it's, I don't know why, you know, there are so many other factors that weigh on uh, growth that to argue that it doesn't really matter if you put taxes up because it won't make any difference is, is a very strange way of looking at it. I just don't understand that. That can't be the argument, you know what I mean? That can't. You could argue that putting down taxes might encourage growth, um, but you can't say that, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if you put up taxes because you don't think it'll discourage growth. 
Um, you've got this stupid, um, these stupid people arguing. But they're, they're arguing for taxes to go up without really making a good case for it. But taxes are, they're extorted, aren't they, really? That's the way that the state extorts money, tax and inflation. And God knows we are getting very close to the end now. You know, we've got, there is so much government debt. The Americans are always were, always were dumb, but in fact have got their, produce the currency which the world uses and then which a lot of world debt is denominated. I've got to a situation where the more the dollar goes up, the more people need dollars because the more dollars they need to pay back debt. So where the American uh, Federal Reserve puts up the interest rates by 0.75% or what they call 750 basis points, it puts the cost of government borrowing, existing government borrowing up, shockingly, but they have still got this option of just printing the money. Um, because although there's, there are two dollars, there are the, the dollar that's used in the United States and there's the dollar that's used in the rest of the world, what they call the Euro dollar. And at the moment, the demand for Euro dollars is still very high. So they can afford to be a little bit more cavalier about raising rates. Whereas in the UK, the chairman of the Bank of England is very well aware that every quarter point that he puts up interest rates, not only does he risk tipping the country into recession, but he risks putting the government debt bill up to a point where they, they can't pay it. You know, whereas we have a serious run on the pound. Whereas we might not have a serious run on the dollar because of the size of the amount of money, of dollars in the world, there's certainly not that many pounds in comparison. So we could have a run on the pound. And then you, you've got the government that really is saying that it wants to help people and get them through this inflation. While, serious, while secretly sort of celebrating the fact that inflation is at 10%. Because it's depreciating their debts because inflation is good for debtors, bad for savers, good for debtors. And uh, and also um, they quite, would quite like a, a recession because it would suppress demand and so uh, that would cool inflation because uh, inflation is in excess of demand over supply. So it's affected by both demand and supply. And if demand goes down, then that should take the heat out of inflation. And if as a side effect, uh, millions of people lose their jobs and have got no spending power at all, then that's even better. But again, inflation down, because nobody can buy anything. So I think there's a serious disconnect between what the public think the government's doing and what the government wants and what the government is really doing and what the, re the government really wants. You know, public want low interest rates, low inflation and high, un high employment. And the government wants high interest rates. Well, actually the government doesn't want high interest rates, but it certainly wants some um, low inflation and it doesn't mind if it puts up an employment to get there. Oi, here we go. All right. Well, hope you followed all that. Nothing dental today. I'll um, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye.